teenage killers are some of the most remorseless killers you can find. Most of them take the lives of others just for fun without stopping for a second to think about the consequences. Over the years, there have been several cases of teenagers who turned into cold-blooded mass killers, but these eight are most infamous for their brutality. The nature of their crimes, from who their victims were and how they murdered them, shows just how twisted these young killers were. Sean Sellers The first on this list of deranged individuals is Sean Sellers, a guy who killed a store clerk and both his parents while they slept when he was just between the ages of 15 and 16. Sellers was born on the 18th of May, 1969, and since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1979, he is one of the 22 people to be executed for crimes committed under the age of 18 and remains the only one to be executed for crimes committed under the age of 17. On March 5, 1986, Sellers killed his mother and stepfather, Vonda and Lee Belafato, while they were asleep in the bedroom of their Oklahoma City home. In order to limit blood splatter on himself, he wore only his underwear and entered their bedroom. First, he shot his stepfather, but the gunshot woke his mother, whom Seller quickly shot in the face. Sellers was meticulous while committing this heinous crime. He even went as far as making the crime scene look like an intruder had broken in and killed his parents. Later on, Seller confessed to killing a 32-year-old store clerk who refused to sell him a beer. Sellers had been drawn into Satanism and claimed to have committed the murders because he was possessed by some demon. Of course, nobody bought that story. Years later, Sellers played the insanity card in order to reduce the gravity of his sentence, but no one bought that either. It was all too far-fetched to be true. Could a demon or insanity have made him arrange the scene of his parents' murder to look like a break-in? Certainly not. He claimed to have read the Satanic Bible numerous times, believing it was an honest way to live, and carrying out the rituals would enable him to control his life. Sellers was found guilty of multiple homicides and sentenced to death in 1986. While he was in prison, Sellers converted to Christianity and was a devout follower of the religion. He appeared several times in the mass media, including The Oprah Winfrey Show. He was featured in quite a few documentaries focused on serial killers and Satanism, and even got married in 1995. Though the marriage was annulled in 1997, in 1999, Sellers appealed his sentence claiming that he had multiple personalities disorder, but even if that were true, the panel of judges concluded that the appeal was made too late. Now, this decision to uphold the death sentence was met with a lot of criticisms and condemnations from Human Rights Watch and even the European Union, claiming that it was immoral to execute someone who was a child at the time he committed the crimes. Psychiatrists, however, dismissed the idea that Sellers was actually mentally ill, citing that real mental illness would have been diagnosed soon after Sellers was arrested and not several years later. Sellers appealed his sentence many times and was repeatedly denied. Despite the various condemnations regarding the decision to execute him, Sean Sellers was executed by lethal injection on February 4, 1999. Next on the list is a 15-year-old who wanted an exchange of gunfire with law enforcement, Nehemiah Griego. On January 19, 2013, South Valley, New Mexico was shocked when news broke that the Griego family had been massacred. To make things worse, it was at the hands of 15-year-old Nehemiah Griego. The victims of this wicked assault were the parents. Greg Griego and his wife Sarah, and their three younger children, a son and two daughters. The father, 51-year-old Greg Griego, was a former pastor at the area's Calvary Church. He served as a chaplain to the Albuquerque Fire Department. The murdered children, 9-year-old Zephaniah, 5-year-old Jail, and 2-year-old Angelina, were Nehemiah's younger siblings living at home. Nehemiah was a bright and talented young musician who played guitar, drums, and bass with his church choir. There was nothing unusual about him. He accompanied his father, a pastor, on rescue missions to Mexico. One would expect that someone who did the awful things Nehemiah did would be a loner, an awkward kid who didn't have any friends. However, that was quite the opposite. He was an outgoing boy with many friends. On January 19, 2013, Nehemiah arrived at his church and reported that his family was dead. Shocked, the pastor and another congregation member, who was a retired homicide detective, decided to drive back to Nehemiah's house. This is when things started to seem a little fishy. The retired detective suspected that something was off about Grigo, and he called 911. They arrived at the house, went in, and saw the chilling sight of the massacre. It wasn't long before Nehemiah confessed to the killings. During his confession, Vince Harrison, the security chief for Calvary Albuquerque, was alarmed by Nehemiah's cold, calm demeanor as he described his dead family and the location of the murder weapons. Early that morning, Nehemiah attacked his family around midnight, starting by shooting his sleeping mother with a .22 rifle, then his nine-year-old brother who was sleeping with their mother. His younger sister woke up crying, and he went into their room and shot the five-year-old. Next to get gunned down was their two-year-old. 
What kind of sick individual would murder little children and a baby like that, you may wonder? Well, Nehemiah didn't seem to have any problems doing it. He was completely unhinged. As if he hadn't had enough carnage, he lay in wait for his father to return home from his shift. At about 5 a.m., his father arrived, whom he then shot multiple times with an AR-15 type semi-automatic rifle. According to Nehemiah, he reloaded the weapons and had planned to drive to a populated area and kill more people before being killed himself in an exchange of gunfire with the law enforcement. Through a stroke of luck, Nehemiah drove to his church instead and no one else was harmed. On February 11, 2016, Judge John J. Romero of the New Mexico Children's Court determined that, based on mental health evaluations, Nehemiah would be sentenced as a juvenile. However, in August 2019, Judge Elisa Hart filed a 75-page order in the Second Judicial District Court that reversed the order of the lower court to have the murderous teen be sentenced in juvenile court. He was ultimately sentenced to three concurrent life sentences plus seven years to run consecutively with the life sentences with credit given for the 2,476 days, six years and 285 days already served and in all must serve 30 years before being eligible for parole. Nehemiah is currently imprisoned in the Lear County Correctional Center. The next killer kid we have is James Fairweather. Imagine walking alone in a park only to discover someone lying in a pool of blood you'd be terrified beyond words. Now around 5.45 a.m. on the 29th of March, 2014, a local man came across a gruesome scene in Castle Park. This man stumbled on another man who had been brutally stabbed to death and lying in a pool of his own blood. The first officer on the scene, PC Benjamin Savory, described the victim of this vicious assault as having lacerations to his head, hands, and face, and a huge amount of blood congealed around his left eye preventing the eye from being visible. The victim was identified as 33-year-old James Atfield, a father of five with a brain injury that cost him the functionality of the left side of his body and affected his reasoning and speech. Atfield had been stabbed a staggering total of 102 times, suffering injuries to his head, face, and torso. The brutal attack left the community of Colchester in shock, fearing that a potential serial killer was on the prowl. Their fears were actualized when another victim, a 31-year-old woman, was found dead at the Salary Brook Trails three months later on the 17th of June, 2014. Her name was Nahid Almanea, and she had been slashed and stabbed 16 times, including once through both eyes. Detectives initially didn't connect the two murders to the same perpetrator. They thought she was a victim of a hate crime, given the fact that she was a Muslim. About a year later, the police were called to report a suspicious teenager hiding in the bush. The woman who came across the teen while walking her dog said, he was no more than 15 feet away and staring straight at me. It's a face that will never leave me, a manic look. Police arrived at the scene and arrested a teenager named James Fairweather, who, at the time of his arrest, was carrying a lock knife and wearing surgical gloves, indicating the woman who called the police might be his next victim. Talk about quick acting and an adequate dose of good luck. That evening, Fairweather confessed to both murders. According to him, he had been hearing voices that told him to murder people. He recollected his past two attacks in gruesome detail and admitted that he was looking for his third victim at the time of his arrest. In January 2016, Fairweather denied two counts of murder and possessing an offensive weapon, but admitted to two alternative counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. However, the prosecution didn't accept the plea and pursued murder charges. Fairweather was now facing a double murder trial. At the trial, it was revealed that Fairweather was obsessed with serial killers and had researched those who had pleaded guilty to manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. Despite his claims that there were voices that told him to make a sacrifice, it was pretty obvious that Fairweather was in total control and knew what he was doing. According to Dr. Joseph, who was called as a prosecution witness, Fairweather's claims of hallucinations were fabricated in an attempt to deceive those who were assessing him. Fairweather had even told doctors of his plan to kill 15 more people before he was caught, and also said that it was Nahid's fault she got killed because she was walking alone when there was a killer on the loose. He was completely unhinged and even declared to the police that if he was bailed, he would kill again. On the 29th of April 2016, Fairweather was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 27 years. Next, there's Charles Starkweather. By now you might be wondering, what's with these kids with weather in their name? While nothing's wrong with the weather, these kids do have something wrong with them. 
Starkweather was born in Lincoln, Nebraska, the third of seven children of Guy and Helen Starkweather. He went from being a good kid to a total monster, and even his family became afraid of him because of his violent outbursts. When he was 18 years old, Starkweather was introduced to 13-year-old Carol Ann Fugate, and before long, the two started dating. Starkweather dropped out of high school in his senior year, took a job at a newspaper, and because it was close to Fugate's school, he would visit her every day. While learning how to drive with Starkweather as the tutor, Fugate crashed the car belonging to Starkweather's father, resulting in his banishment from the family home. Not long after getting kicked out, Starkweather quit his job and became a garbage collector. Believing that his current situation was the final determinant of how he would live the rest of his life, Starkweather began developing a nihilistic worldview. He had a biological need to acquire power over others others and didn't like it if someone looked better than him or above him in general. He had a personal philosophy. Dead people are all on the same level. Starkweather committed his first murder on November 30th, 1957. He attempted to buy a stuffed animal on credit, but Robert Colvert, the service station attendant, refused, much to Starkweather's frustration. After returning several times during the night to purchase small items, he ultimately brandished a shotgun and forced Colvert to give him $100. He abducted Colvert and took him to a remote area where the two of them struggled over the gun before Starkweather fired several rounds at Colvert and ended his life. In 1958, Starkweather's murder spree began. He went to Fugate's home, and her parents told him off. He fatally shot them both and clubbed their two-year-old daughter Betty Jean to death. According to Fugate, when she arrived, Starkweather had told her that her parents were hostages and that she and her family would be safe if she cooperated with him. Some days later, Starkweather and Fugate drove to the farmhouse of August Meyer, a 70-year-old man who also happened to be one of Fugate's family friends. Starkweather blasted the shotgun at his head, killing him instantly. The couple fled the area and got their car stuck in a ditch. Two teenagers offered to give them a ride only for Starkweather to force them to drive back to an abandoned storm cellar. He shot one of them in the back of the head and attempted to rape the other. Unable to do so, an angry Starkweather fatally shot the girl. The pair fled the area in the car of those people Starkweather just killed. They drove to a wealthy section of Lincoln and entered the home of industrialist C. Lauer Ward and his wife Clara. Starkweather fatally stabbed their maid Ludmila and waited for the man and his wife to return home. He also killed the family dog by breaking its neck so it wouldn't alert the house owners. Clara was the first to come back, and Starkweather stabbed her to death. That same day, he shot and killed Lauer, who was just returning home in the evening. These particular murders sparked a lot of outrage. A search began to find the perpetrators, and soon several sightings were made of Starkweather and Fugate. The pair ran out of luck when Starkweather killed his 11th victim in an attempt to steal his vehicle because theirs was identified and therefore compromised. However, something was off about this particular car. It had a parking brake, a completely new concept to Starkweather. The car stalled because the brake brakes hadn't been released. A passing motorist stopped to help, but Starkweather pointed a rifle at him, beginning an altercation that would be noticed by Sheriff's Deputy William Romer. Starkweather drove off, but was unable to escape the police and surrendered. Carol Fugate was convicted as an accomplice and received a life sentence, but was paroled after 17 and a half years in prison. Starkweather, on the other hand, was executed 17 months after his arrest by electric chair. Tyler Hadley at 1.15 p.m. on July 16, 2011, Tyler Hadley, a 17-year-old living in Port St. Lucie, Florida, posted a status on Facebook. Party at my crib tonight, maybe? Most parents are usually against their kids throwing parties, especially in their home, so one had to wonder, did Tyler's parents really consent to their son having a house party? The chances are very slim. It turned out that even if they knew their son was throwing a party, they couldn't do anything about it. Why, you may ask? Well, the answer is simple. They were dead, killed by Tyler himself. What would make a teen go out of his way to murder his own parents who loved him so much? Tyler had myriad run-ins with the law before he ultimately killed his parents. He had participated in drug use, sales, and purchases, and had been criminally detained for arson, vandalism, thefts, aggravated battery, and now murder. Prior to the parasites, he had been enrolled in an outpatient drug treatment program, which was not working because he was not willing to stop using drugs. He was about to turn 18, and his parents were desperate to help him quit his drug use, so they enrolled Tyler in an inpatient treatment program for him, which was stated to be an additional motive for the crime. On the day he brutally murdered his parents, Tyler posted on his Facebook status that he would be throwing a party at his parents' house. He took three pills of ecstasy, perhaps figuring he wouldn't be able to go through with his plan while sober. Then he stood behind his mother while she was working on her computer before attacking her with the back end of a claw hammer. His mother turned 
turned and screamed. Why? Blake heard the screams and ran into the room to find his son Tyler savagely attacking his wife. Blake was so shocked, all he could do was echo his wife's question before Tyler fatally beat him too. After killing his parents, Tyler dragged their dead bodies into their bedroom and spent hours cleaning up the bloody mess he had just made. Later that night, Tyler had a party at the house just as he had planned and over 60 people attended. The drinks and cigars for the party Tyler bought with his parents' money. They played beer pong in the kitchen and rubbed cigarettes into the walls, all the while completely unaware of the gruesome sight Tyler was hiding in the master bedroom. He claimed that his parents no longer lived there and that the house was now his. However, he confessed to his best friend Michael Mandel at the party that he had killed his parents. Mendel's response was one of disbelief. No, you didn't, Tyler. Shut up. What are you talking about? Michael responded. Hadley even went as far as showing him that his parents' cars were still in the driveway as further proof that he had murdered them. Thinking it was a silly prank, Mendel still didn't believe his friend. Ultimately, Tyler took Mendel to the bedroom where he hid the bodies under a lot of furniture and other items that reminded him of his parents. Mendel realized his buddy was telling the truth. Mendel was smart not to leave the party right away. He even took a selfie with Tyler shortly after seeing the gruesome sight. Mendel eventually left the party and called Crime Stoppers to report the murders. He said that Tyler had used a hammer to murder both his parents. Tyler was arrested that morning for the murders and was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. He is imprisoned in the Okeechobee Correctional Institution. Next up is a guy infamous for being one of the youngest killers in United States history, Craig Price. On September 4th, 1989, Marie Bouchard went to check on her daughter Joan Heaton and her two grandchildren, 10-year-old Jennifer and 8-year-old Melissa at their home. She was accompanied by her other daughter, Mary Lou. After letting themselves in, they came upon an unspeakable discovery. They saw Joan lying beneath blood-soaked sheets in the hallway. Her oldest daughter, Jennifer, was lying nearby and Melissa was on the kitchen floor. All three had been brutally murdered. The victims all had numerous stab wounds. The youngest child, Melissa, was stabbed so fiercely that one of the blades actually broke off in her neck. Because of the brutality of the murders, detectives were able to determine that the attacker was vicious enough to have injured himself during the assault. It was also suggested that the crime was probably connected with another unsolved murder that took place two years earlier in Buttonwoods, thanks to the rather significant coincidences between the crimes. Two years prior, in July 1987, 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer was found dead in her living room. She too had suffered multiple stab wounds. A day after the bodies were discovered, detectives were driving through a park near Buttonwoods when one of them spotted the 15-year-old boy named Craig Price. When questioning him, the investigators couldn't help but notice a bandage on his hand. When asked how he got hurt, Craig claimed that he had gotten drunk a few nights ago and broken a car window with his hand. But why would he bother admitting to police officers that he vandalized a car? That on its own is an offense. Further investigation uncovered a bloody sock imprint. Whoever it was that left that imprint, they wore a size 13 shoe, and it wasn't any of the Heatons. Despite his age, the investigators chose to look into Craig's story only for them to find that it was all all a pack of lies. Craig took and failed a lie detector test and police decided to investigate his home. One morning, everyone was awakened and had to stay in the living room. They were all distressed that the police were ransacking their home, all except for Craig, who wandered off into dreamland while on the couch. He was too sleepy to worry about all the drama, it would seem. Before long, investigators found what they were looking for. They happened upon a treasure trove of incriminating evidence as their search turned up a trash bag of several bloody knives. Craig would have to worry about nap time some other time. They woke him up and arrested him for the murders, a turn of events that didn't seem to bother him in the slightest. He seemed unfazed by what was going on. When it came to confessions, the detectives, in this case, got more than expected. Craig offered details of how his crimes were committed. The confession stunned everyone present, including Craig's father, John Price, who went to the men's room to vomit. It was that bad. When asked about the murder of Rebecca Spencer, Craig confessed to her murder. This crime he committed when he was just 13 years old. Craig's case sent ripples around the nation, especially since, considering his age and the laws in place at the time, he would be released after being held in a training school until his 21st birthday, meaning that Craig would be a free man with a clean record after a measly five years. After several protests followed by Craig's bad behavior in the Institute, Craig's sentence was ultimately extended. Now, no one's sure when he'll be released, but he's been in prison for a really long time now, and it looks like he'll stay there even longer. Barry Lukaitis. When he was in eighth grade, 
14-year-old Barry Lukaitis armed himself with a rifle and two handguns, waltzed into his algebra class, and opened fire. In his rampage, he gunned down the algebra teacher, Leona Cares, 14-year-old Manuel Vela Jr., and Arnold Fritz, who was also just 14 years old. But what would make a teenager execute such a horrific plan on his peers and teacher? Barry's parents weren't exactly on good terms and were in the middle of a divorce, though they lived in the same house. Despite having step-siblings, Barry lived alone with two angry adults. This sort of environment is bound to have a profound impact on a young boy. Barry was often teased by the other children about his troubled home, his studiousness, and the fact that he often wore cowboy clothes. Something changed in Barry over time. He began to have a darker side to him, often making references to death and killing. He read books like Rage, a novel about a high school senior who shot his algebra teacher. It was oddly similar to the crime Barry himself would later commit. Barry also liked Pearl Jam's music video, Jeremy, which took inspiration from a real story of a teenager who shot himself in front of his English class in Richardson, Texas in 1991. The music video depicts a young boy unloved by his parents who always fought in his presence and taunted by other children at the school. One of Barry's favorite movies was Natural Born Killers, a movie inspired by the crimes committed by Charles Starkweather. Barry's father, Terry Lukaitis, owned three guns and taught him how to use them. Terry was worried about the mental health of his soon-to-be ex-wife, Joanne, so he hid the guns in the trunk of his car. She found them and started carrying one of the handguns in the pocket of her jacket, much to Terry's concern. All of a sudden, the other guns disappeared. Terry reported this to the police, concerned that Joanne might have removed the guns. Never did it cross his mind to be worried about his son. He said that Barry was the most normal out of all his kids. Boy, was he wrong. Terry was unaware that Barry was taunted by his classmates, or that he was writing dark stories in English class. He was blissfully unaware that for a week before the murders, his son Barry was trapped in what psychiatrists called psychotic delusion. On Friday, February 2nd, after his parents left for work, Barry armed himself with his father's rifle and two handguns and walked a mile and a half to school in terribly cold weather. He got to Frontier Junior High through a back door and made his way to his algebra classroom where all hell would break loose. The teacher, 49-year-old Leona Keras, was at the blackboard when Barry walked in, pulled out the rifle, and shot Manuel Vela Jr. sitting in the front row, killing him and Arnold Fritz who sat behind. The shot also blasted through the right arm of 13-year-old Natalie Hintz. Barry then turned, aimed at Leona, and squeezed the trigger. As she fell to the floor, Barry adapted a line from the book, Rage. This sure beats panty raids. Barry's version was, this sure beats algebra. Barry then held the class hostage, but thanks to a quick and decisive tackle by the gym coach, Jonathan Lane, Barry was subdued and arrested. Barry Lukaitis was convicted of murder and kidnapping and sentenced to two life terms plus 205 years, with no chance of parole. On April 19th, 2017, he was resentenced to 189 years in prison. Harvey Miguel Robinson. From a young age, Robinson was already a dissident. At the age of nine, Robinson was caught shoplifting and entered the juvenile system, and throughout his youth, he continued committing petty crimes. Robinson seemed to be drawn to violence considering the fact that he adored and looked up to his father, despite his extremely violent nature. In 1963, Robinson's father was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and sentenced to six to 12 years in state prison for beating his mistress to death with a blunt object. This was the sort of person Robinson had idolized, making people believe that his acceptance of murder was a result of him worshipping his father, leading Robinson to commit murder himself. In August 1992, a 29-year-old nurse's aide named Joan Burghardt was raped and bludgeoned in her home. She had been bludgeoned 37 times. This was the first of three attacks that will be linked to Robinson. He was 17 when he started his murders. In June 1993, Robinson struck again, raping and stabbing 15-year-old newspaper carrier Charlotte Schmoyer. Charlotte's supervisors contacted the police after they were unable to locate her, and soon after, her body was found in a wooded area nearby. A mere 11 days after murdering Charlotte, Robinson broke into a house not too far from Charlotte's. Robinson grabbed the woman's five-year-old daughter from her bed, raped her, and choked her. Luckily for the mother, she was in bed with a boyfriend at the time, making Robinson change his mind from raping and possibly killing her. In another stroke of luck, the five-year-old girl survived the attack. In July, one month after the murder of Charlotte Schmoyer, Robinson beat a 47-year-old woman, Jessica Jean Fortney, raped her and then strangled her. Her daughter and son-in-law discovered her body early that morning. Robinson ran out of luck when he raped and brutalized Denise Sam Kelly in her home. Fortunately, she escaped. Several nights later, Robinson returned to her home and attempted to break in, but things were different this time. It was a trap 
a police officer was waiting for him. However, Robinson being downright crazy, tried to kill the police officer. Robinson was injured while trying to escape but was tracked to a local hospital where he was arrested. Robinson is also believed to have been the one who broke into the room of a 13-year-old girl who was beaten with a brick. He was scared off when the girl's friend who came over for the evening began to scream. She's believed to have been Robinson's first victim. Robinson was initially sentenced to death, but a county judge vacated two of the death sentences on technical grounds involving the jury's consideration of aggravating circumstances. Over and over again, the case was delayed as a result of several appeals. But on November 29, 1994, Robinson was sentenced to death for the Fortney murder in Lehigh County. And in December 2013, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court upheld Robinson's death penalty in the Fortney murder. In October 2019, a Pennsylvania judge urged Robinson to consider donating his brain to science, calling it the one gift you can give. Robinson is currently incarcerated on death row in the state prison in Greaterford, Montgomery County. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card on your screen for more content like this. See you next time.